I'm Robin Miller Brecker. And I'm Karen Lenzer. Welcome to Seeking Center, the podcast. Join us each week as we have the conversations and weed through the spiritual and holistic clutter for you. We'll boil it down to what you need to know now. We're all about total wellness, which to us means building a healthy life on a physical, mental, and spiritual level. We'll talk to the trailblazers who will introduce you to the practices, products, and experiences that may be just what you need to hear about to transform your life. If you're listening to this, it's no accident. Think of this as your seeking center and your place to seek your center. And for even more mega inspo, sign up for Seeking Center, the newsletter at seekingcenter.app. How often have you thought about your little self, the very little you that was unknowingly taking everything in and also approaching everything with love and wide-eyed curiosity? That little self has a big impact on your current self. And we're going to talk all about it with Christine Ryan. Christine is a transformational life coach who for over 40 years has been helping people move from where they are unhappy or stuck to where they are at peace and in alignment with their soul's journey. She uses emotional clearing and healing practices such as spiritual response therapy, emotional freedom therapy, or EFT, breath work, hypnotherapy, counseling, action plans, and divination tools in her work. We love Christine. We both had the opportunity to work with her, and Karen even had the privilege of working with her in Magical Sedona. She's a wealth of wisdom on making meaningful shifts in your life and especially help you get to the root of inner child wounds and begin to reparent yourself so that you can live your most joyful and fulfilling life. There's so much to discuss. Hi, Christine. Hi, Christine. Hi, Robin. Hi, Karen. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you very much for hosting this forum for all of us. Oh, we were just saying it's way overdue. We've known you for such a long time and have learned so much from you. So we're really excited to have this conversation today. And let's start with where you live, because we know (laughs) that is how we became connected with you because Karen met you in Magical Sedona. So what called you there and then kept you there? It's kind of a fun story, really. My older sister and I, who also lives here now, we did a road trip back in the 70s when people were doing that. And we had the curtains and the bed in the back and the van, and we drove all around the United States. So somebody told us to go to Jerome, Arizona, which is a little outside of Sedona. So when we looked at the map, we looked from, okay, we're to get from Flagstaff to Jerome, we're going to go through this little highway called 89A, and we never made it to Jerome. <laughs> because that little highway happened to go through Sedona. And right away, we met some really fun people, young people like ourselves. So right away, we were invited to jump into the magic of Sedona. So of course, we fell in love. Had you ever seen anything like it? And at that time, you really couldn't look things up on the internet. So I'm assuming. No, and you were doing paper maps at the time, right? So we had no idea. We were literally scared. Screaming as we drove down the canyon road and entered as Sedona was just spread out in front of us. And the mountains are shaped like emperors and guardians and goddesses. And so just literally emoting energy as we were taking it in because it was so stunning. But also the energy was very higher vibration, different vibration. You literally feel it. Many people to this day talk about how they get emotional just driving into Sedona. I know I did. I couldn't get over how you're in this flat desert area and then all of a sudden it just springs to life in front of you. And it's not just visual, like you said, Christine, it is energetic. It's palpable. It makes you feel like you're in literally another world when you get there. Were you and your sister spiritual at all at that stage in your life? We were both so interested in exploring that aspect of who we are. But at the time it was opening. So I really started with simple things like yoga. And I came across a book and it discussed the philosophy behind it and then postures and the purpose of the postures. And I was 14 when I found that book in our own basement. (laughs) No way. Really? (laughs) My dad was a landlord and sometimes people left things behind. So somebody left a bookshelf of books and he just stuck it in the basement. And I was always a bookworm and was half a yoga. I remember as a little yellow book. I don't remember the author, but at a very young age, we were raised Catholic and really went to school. 
five days a week, inundated with a Catholic, and then on Sunday. But I had a very spontaneous vision, again, around 13 or 14, of the yin-yang symbol. It just came to me. In, it, it was like sleep form, the worlds between consciousnesses, and got the message, this is God. And for me, that just is all oh, this makes so much more sense. God is energy. So I was able to not be too indoctrinated with Catholicism and the Christianity, my early religious years. And same thing for my sister. We just were open. Sedona was the only place we stayed. We stayed here for two weeks. So we both ended up moving back here within a year. Wow. Was there anybody specifically that you met during that visit or was there any specific experience that you had that really made you feel like this is where we need to be? Being two young women, we met two young men. (laughs) (laughs) I love the look on your face. And it was really, so they really opened their home and their hearts and showed us around and took us to some really magical places. And then we met a lot of young people. It was a great community. And then I actually met a significant other who is the father of my daughter. He had the very first spiritual bookstore here in Sedona. He called it the House of Light. And people would just come and walk in and go, I don't know why I'm here. And he goes, okay, let me help you with that. And he would guide them to different resources or people and all of that. And then there were just some really cool elders that lived here that were spiritual, that were also great mentors to us younger people. I'll tell you, one of the best things about growing up in Sedona, because I moved here when I was 20, is discernment. Yeah. Just Because there were a lot of people that would come to Sedona and claim to be enlightened or gurus that weren't. <laughs> So this is, again, where what you're doing is just so precious because it's digging into the the roots of authenticity. Yeah. Well, and so how did you develop and start to trust your intuition? Oh, I love that question. Okay. The best teacher for me about learning to listen to my intuition is when I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) I have not heard that one before. (laughs) Oh, think about it. Haven't you ever gotten a hit and then you did it anyway? And you're like, why did I do that? And I paid no regrets. Everything has value and gifts and learning and growing. But I had some things in my life where it was like, I had a hit and I didn't listen to it. And I paid a big price for that. Wow. And then the converse of that, the other side of that, which is following a hit and then having it work out. It made no sense to move to Sedona. And you were coming from Wisconsin, right? Yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, that's far away. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. absolutely. And of course, nobody understood it. My family were like, what? Christine, have you always followed this spiritual path and the work that you're doing? Did that start immediately when you got to Sedona? Or were you in a period where you were learning and growing before you started teaching and practicing? I got into spiritual exploration young. And it did get shelved after I had kids. I was working, I was a teacher, I had kids, so it was a lot of just householding, raising a family, including, I did move to California for 15 years. It was actually really conservative. So I ended up slowly, at first I'd start off by having my cards on the bookshelf or my crystals out in public, and the comments that my kids were exposed to were like, oh, that's the devil's work. Is your mom a witch? So I'm just like, you know what? We're going to just put this stuff away (laughs) for now. And then as all the kids got older and they were thinking for themselves again, I was doing readings for them. (laughs) I bet. But it's always there. And then here's another great example of intuition. We were living in California. Great life. Nice community. Nice group of friends. Great school where the kids were. All that. But I got a really strong hit. It was time to leave. And the only place I wanted to go was Sedona. And I I talked to my then husband at the time and he'd be like, no, I never want, I'm a California boy. And it just would not go away. So I just kept bringing it up and bringing it up. And then he agreed. And then my daughter who was then in high school agreed. And it's been really great. That was in 1999. But I'm telling you, when we went back, our neighborhood, it had really changed to the place where we were grateful we weren't living there anymore. And so that's part. And plus, then we just loved 
our life. We all went to the creek the other day and he was like, I want to thank you for making me come to Sedona. Isn't that sweet? That's an example of listening. And it really elevated our life. And then it elevated our community. I was here to be able to be an you know, integral part of Sedona Soul Adventures as it was just an idea. And then now it's amazing. And that also has taught me to listen to my intuition. And then it sounds like when you moved back, it was your time to really work on your abilities. A hundred percent. Christine, for those who've never been to Sedona, how would you describe the energy there and the draw of the land? I know when both Robin and I were there, we weren't there together, but we both felt so attached to the land itself, our feet on the ground and like literally immersing ourselves in that. Can you just as a resident, as somebody who's lived there, can you just describe what that feels like living there? I will tell you after 35 years total of living in Sedona, I still get emotional when I come back from a trip, no matter how wonderful the trip was. I am, it's this, there, there is that energetic home. Sedona has And I'm not a historian. I know a little bit, okay? But Sedona has always been considered sacred, even for the the First Nations that would live around here. They still come down to Montezuma's well and get water for their sacred ceremony and come through Sedona. The people, so then from early on, the people that were drawn to live here. One of the original people that I met in Sedona way back in the day was a rancher who was very spiritual and would host spiritual meetings meetings at his house, and which is now a national park that he donated to the National Park Service. So people get to visit there all the time. But originally that was his ranch. So it's always drawn people and then supported explorers, visionaries, healers. There's a real connection for a lot of people. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? right? If we hold something sacred, it's sacred. And if we acknowledge that it's sacred, it's sacred. So Sedona has always been almost an entity in herself to hold in that sacred energy. Um, I know we're going to dive into the inner child and what that means, but I also wanted just to recognize all of the different practices and tools that you have in your toolbox. Do you use them all when you're working with people in your life coaching? and so forth? I use the tools that are appropriate for where the person is and what they're open to. One of my favorite sayings is, I'm a believer that you can have it all, just not all at the same time. (laughs) So of course, this has been an evolvement. I've been at this for a really long time. So first, I didn't start out to be somebody else's life coach. I started off to be my own. (laughs) Yeah. It all evolved from doing my own, you know, and and then learning the tools that I felt were really valuable for me that really were, oh, I love how this shifted or I like how this works or that kind of a thing. And then bit by bit learn something new. I love to keep learning. So the inner child. Yeah, let's dive into the inner child. Yes, because as a coach, it's obvious we all have inner child wounds. Not all of our inner child is wounded. But the wounds really get in our way. And I want to really make this clear. I really truly believe that we all have these inner child wounds because that's what we came to learn and grow and evolve through. To me, there is nothing more important that we can leave this planet with other than self-love. And I don't mean selfish love. When you love yourself, you love. You are love. You be love. So it's not, we always say, oh, something wrong. No, it's an opportunity and an invitation to grow. And I think it's lifelong. At least it is for me. (laughs) You think you've done a layer? Yes, we have. But then there's another one. And I think that, again, is part of each one of our individual intentions. Do we want to even accept the invitation? Some people don't. That's totally fine. That's where they are. Although, Although it does end up catching up when you don't pay attention push it I down. Know. Yeah. but I say it's totally fine because when it's supposed to be they're going to be ready that's it's, so it's, true their life is going to get so uncomfortable but that's always how it works for us it's not that they're going to get going. we get really uncomfortable and then we know oh I got to do something different so again it's an invitation to change and grow so how do you work with someone from the very beginning on in this process if they come to you and are looking for coaching what might not even think 
it has something to do with their inner child. How do you introduce that to them and help them identify what some of those inner child wounds might be? There's different approaches. It's really through conversation and questions. And over time, again, noticing themes. So being able to just, oh, so would you say that you be the giver? in your life. You know, are you the one that gives more than receives? And so that just starts that conversation of one of the inner child wounds of needing to give in order to receive, in order to feel worthy. And to add to Karen's question, when we're talking about inner child, what are we talking about in terms of age? We're really talking about our egoic child self that was born, that grew in the womb. We absorb things even there and, and then was born and then lived this life with all the experiences that help to form us. And then that is typically how we show up out in the world. So that part of ourselves, we would really, I label the masculine. It's the part of ourselves that shows up in the world. What our career is, how we see ourselves, the producer, the one that gets things done. And then, so we all have this holy trinity, the masculine and the feminine. So the feminine is the part of ourself that can receive, that takes it in. So that feminine part of ourself receives and receiving all good things, including our intuition, our wisdom, not blocking it, being open to it, listening to it, receiving all good things from the universe. So ideally, we want to work with the feminine receiving those intuitive hits and then the masculine acting on it. It, it creates such a nice flow. So when we just depend on the masculine, we're just making it happen. I got to make it happen. So the feminine, it makes more of a flow. Okay, let me get the hit. Let me, what is the right direction? What feels right? All of that. Then the child. The child is the third part of our holy trinity, our internal sacred geometry is innocence, mm -hmm. faith, trust, deservedness, permission. Think of the little kids, and I hope you know kids that are have good, healthy lives. They don't question where things are coming from or if they deserve education or if they deserve a good pair of shoes when there's wear out. It's just not even a, there's not a doubt. Do I deserve this? So that's our inner child. So the wounds show up, anything blocking that, things that block permission to receive good, things that make us feel less than. And then we can identify our wounds by our triggers what sets us off we always want to act like it's the other person but it's our trigger is our wound yes and people don't think of it that way right on and because we're so used to blaming them you shouldn't do that that makes me upset like that rather than it's my responsibility when i get upset it's a whole different perspective but that's where the healing comes in would you say another word for wound might be a belief in a way yes like absolutely 100%. No, big girls don't cry. Money doesn't grow on trees, things like that. Because I'm just thinking back. To, so it causes you to have a belief that either causes fear or shuts you off in some way from that bubbly, loving, light infused child that you came into the world being. So as you're doing that inventory of those things that could be wounds, it's not necessarily like your mom yelled at you and made you feel inferior, although it could be some of those other little things. They're limiting beliefs in a way. 100%. Karen. Yeah. And it's not all from our mom and dad. We got to stop that. <laughs> not to say it, it isn't. I can definitely identify some challenges in my life, some beliefs that I continually need to outgrow that did come from the way I was parented or just my family, the way we were raised. And we are complicated beings, but that is the reparenting is when we get triggered, instead of looking and making it about the other person, we go right inside and we comfort our own child, our little girl or boy that somebody said something mean. And again, it doesn't mean that the other person didn't say something mean or do something neglectful or whatever, but that's not going to help contribute to any healing. The healing comes in. It's like you would want to speak to your inner child in that moment. You wish your parents spoke to you when you were struggling or hurt or like you would speak to your own kids when they're three or four and somebody pushed them down but like, yeah i know a lot of us are raised by you're okay get up you're fine but really our inner child really wishes we just got over and give them a hug and say you're okay good job that comfort and so that's where we can start healing ourselves and this kind of work yes that kind of thing we can only do ourselves. But to have guidance and to have, it really does help to have somebody guide you to, okay, what does this look like? Walk me through it at least once or twice. 
so that we can really understand it. I was going to just ask before we even go into the healing and what that could look like, what are some of the most common inner child wounds? It always boils down to some form of unworthiness. There's something wrong with me, or I'm unlovable, or I have to earn love, or a lot of really great achievers. And this is great motivation, but still, I have to prove I'm lovable. I'm like, all right, again, earning, I got to earn it. It's not just a given. It's not that unconditional love. So then here's what's important. A lot of it is instilled, we call these imprints, instilled from growing up. You know, it could be teachers, coaches, other kids, right? Siblings, parents, it could be an experience experience with a dog that now you don't like dogs. You know what I mean? It's like lots and lots. We're very complicated beings. And so just being present with what is going on within it is what brings in the healing, not making it about the outer. As long as we're making it about the outer, it's not going to work. We can't change them. And we're not healing our inner child. So you really want to treat. And so that's the other thing. So when you feel triggered, Go in and do the healing. It's comfort. It's just comfort. And by the way, a great jin chin jitsu tool. Why do children suck their thumb? So hold your thumb. It's very comforting. Yeah. So children have these natural instincts. Let's say somebody triggers you and you get angry. You're angry because you're hurt. You still need comfort. Okay, so then it's always the hurt that what triggers us and whatever emotion shows up on the outside, it's that hurt. So that's our opportunity to go right inside, do that inner child healing. And that's part of the reparenting, um, right? That is exactly what reparenting is. Nobody else can do that. And then when we're growing up, yeah, it comes from the outside, it does. And it's our part of it was believing it or accepting it. But then from like 20s on, we're doing it to ourselves. It's not coming from the outside. Again, even if somebody's rude to us or neglects us or anything, it's still that real reaction. It's almost a learned behavior, a learned belief, so that you're automatically going to that without even thinking about it, which is why it's a trigger. And what I love, I'm just thinking about what you're saying and how to do this in a practice. And I think for so many of us, because when we become adults, we're like, oh, I shouldn't feel that way. Or I should just get over it. And we're always talking to ourselves in that way versus if you can imagine yourself as a little one. It so makes Karen, you- let's yeah. do that. Can we okay. take five minutes? Sure. Okay. Let's do that right now because I am telling you it is. It's powerful. So for anybody listening, if you're driving, don't do this. But if you can take five minutes to just close your eyes and check in with yourself and imagine your four-year-old self. Big, wide, innocent eyes and curiosity and openness to what people are telling you and you're just right there and just imagine that sweet child standing in front of you four years old and now just because we're doing this as a group now say to her some of the negative things you say to yourself you're dumb you can't do this who are you to think you're so good you're fat. I hate my body. Okay. You get it. What are the negative things you say to yourself and say this to this little four-year-old? And is that fair? Mm -hmm. Are any of those things true? That's who you're talking to when you have negative self-talk. You're not really talking to your adult self that can quote, get over it. You're repeating often from early on negative things that now you're adopting and you're doing to yourself. So we can stop that right now. You would never do that to a child, would you? You would never deliberately make them feel less than or unworthy. So never, ever do that to yourself again. Isn't that powerful when you realize, oh, that little innocent, oh my God. That's huge, actually. And it applies to so many different things. I'm just thinking about myself as the oldest of six children and how at times you can be jealous of someone else because you feel like they're getting the toy or you have to share the toy with someone else or share your parents' attention with someone else, or you get the hand-me-down versus getting the new clothes. It can really imprint in so many different levels so that when that jealousy triggers you, you think it's an adult jealousy, but it really isn't. It really stems from that 
early on experience. And I love how you guys are so great and the way you just weave the conversation and make the connections. And so it would show up, like, let's say that having to share your tour, having to share everything. And me too, grew up in a big family, have to share everything. It shows up now in adulthood when let's say you go out to dinner and somebody wants a bite of your food. You think, why does that bother me? Because it's just that I just don't want to share right now. Don't make me share or whatever it is. It's that little child that was made to. And now to be polite, you're like, oh, sure. Sure. But really what you're saying is no, back off or feeling. And I'm, that's just an example because we laugh about it. That's my sister and I. But see how it shows up though. Yeah, the people pleasing thing yeah. can crop up. Or I know for me, it's always feeling like I have to do for others because I was the oldest and yep. helping yep. mom other kids and feeling like that was my role to be valuable because I was the oldest and that was my job in a way and how you realize, gosh, you think it's just your behavior today. But when you really look at the triggers in particular, they always can be traced back. And you guys are super intuitive. And I know most of your listeners are for sure. So you'll know that trigger will tell you what that wound is. And really, even if you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. All you need is comfort. So like sharing, I've given myself full permission to not have to share anymore. <laughs> Honey, you don't have to. And if I don't mind, I don't mind. But it's like, I don't have to. It's, well, oh, now I don't mind. Now it's coming from my heart rather than expectation or that belief or that imprinting from childhood. What it also brought up for me, in addition to that idea of those things that as an adult, you may say to yourself or think, and would you ever say that to a four-year-old and then your four-year-old self, I also love this idea too of when you're not sure and you may not trust your own intuition in terms of whether you should or shouldn't do something, go to that four-year-old self, that four-year-old little you and ask that little you, would you want to do that? Because a four-year-old has no problem saying, I don't want to do that. I don't want to. Excellent, do Rob. I, I, and you could just see yourself like sitting down with your legs crossed. No, I don't want to do that. And if that's the reaction you get, because you're not sure you trust your own intuition as an adult, I think that is an actual good way of making some decisions. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's one of my favorite tools I share. Do we have time? Can I share this real quick? Please. Yeah. This is a tool to do exactly that. Check within our gut, our intuition, our feelings, and then really deliberately asking the inner child. I love that bringing that right in there. And this is good caring for you too, for people that are like used to doing a lot for others. We're just kind of, that's how we're trained. So the first part, Never answer yes or no right away. Give people a non-answer. Even if you have to get back to them soon, still, the first answer is, I'll get back to you. Or let me check my calendar. Because often our habitual behavior is we'll say yes. Yeah. And then later we're like, doy. And that doy part is the little child who said, hey, you didn't ask. So first, never answer. The second part of the three parts is check with your gut, your intuition, your little child. What feels right? What am I giving up if I do this? Who else could do this? Who benefits if I do this? Just a few questions and boom, here comes an answer. And then the third part, and this can be hard at first, but it gets easier, is to get back to people with the answer that honors you, that takes care of your inner child, that listens to her and honors her. That is another way of reparenting. Again, it's really a practical thing. How would you wish your parents had treated you. And then knowing that we're really old souls when we come in, it's a double whammy when we're treated inappropriately or insignificant, you know what I mean? As if we were insignificant when in our being, we know how powerful we are and yet we're being told this thing. So then that creates conflict and then that keeps us stuck because we're conflicted. So, and it's an ongoing thing. So it's really fun. So that three-part strategy, it can be a life changer. I share it with most of my clients and it, it has changed my life. Let me put it that way. I used to be the doer the go-to person and I did it because I wanted the approval. So you like me? Yeah, they like me for five minutes. There's a lot I of people listening who will appreciate this guidance because that is our instinct for many people. Mm-hmm. Just yes. say yes, but giving the three steps, especially that first one, take the pause. That's pause. right. That's so right. think right. about the behavior of that little child and how they really are tuned in within themselves before they do anything. They're always so present. They follow their happiness. They follow what their interest is. They aren't necessarily dissuaded by others or they don't think about what other people are thinking at all. They're just fully themselves. I'm going to start doing this, Christine. I promise. It's so excellent. Think thinking. of it really as your personal sacred trinity that is really a strong foundation of the law of 
of three that when you need to go in comfort, it's your masculine and feminine stepping in as mom and dad. I got your back. Okay. You can cry or what? And I just, for everybody listening, most of you who've listened to this podcast for some time realize that in every person, there is a masculine and a feminine side of yourself. But if you haven't heard that in one of our previous episodes, know that it doesn't matter what your gender is. We all have a masculine and a feminine side. And what to Christine's point is there and a child. And so really think of it that way. And you think about what each of those parts or mean to you as a soul in this body. I just want to point that out for people who may not a hundred percent understand what we mean. Excellent. And when we operate evenly on these three points where we attend to these three points, the feminine being the spiritual and the receiving, the masculine being working out there in the world and producing and getting things. And then the child coming from trust and faith, innocence, excitement, what's next. Think about it. If we're operating equally on all three, it's like, what a nice balance. Yeah. What a harmonious existence. Yeah. And for those that that are doing this exercise and trying to picture themselves. And I use the word trying because maybe they're having a hard time picturing their little you or their little selves because maybe there was a lot of trauma and maybe they wanted to block that out. How do you suggest they help themselves heal? Such a great question. I'm going to be honest. This is hard to do on your own. Yes, you can. To do that inner child reparenting, that's only us that can do that. That's an inner work, inside job. However, to get going and to get some practical guidance for the tool that works best for that person, to get past resistance. I do encourage people to reach out for help and support. I really do. And there's a lot of great people out there that do that. But once you get the tool, it is an inside job. And that's the responsibility. And it really is. It's like pulling up the big girl, big boy panties. It's like, all right, no one's going to do this. Like, No one can do this except me. And when it comes to the emotional clearing work that you do or other practitioners may do, how does that all also then help as you are facing that inner child wound. It helps identify because even though I say glibly, oh, your triggers will tell you what your wound is. That's kind of complicated. What do you mean? And plus we are complicated beings. So again, that's why I recommend some guidance. But yes, it helps identify what those wounds are through different modalities. For me, I really like spiritual response therapy because it's a very intuitive work. It works in the spiritual realms. It works with the client's high self. So it's bypassing the ego that might be resistant or in denial and goes to identifying the issues, which then are usually fueled by emotions. And so let's say somebody's go-to emotion is anger. A 50-year-old person that goes to anger a lot has a lot of accumulated anger. So it's very easy to go there now. It's not even, oh, I'm pissed off. It's like, I'm angry, like that. And a lot of that is not just because of that situation, it's the accumulation. So emotional healing can clear accumulated emotion. It can clear patterns of beliefs. Like when you hear them out loud, it's, oh, I relate to that. Shoot, I really do that. A lot of us, once I identify the giver and give to receive, and it's people like, oh yeah, oh gosh, oh yeah, I do that. And our culture kind of does train that religion they focus more on the women around that men have other issues sometimes the imposter syndrome shows up a lot for them which is just that they're doing their job great but their inner child is when are they going to find out it's just a kid running the show you know what i mean and that's just that's an inner dialogue but it just it shows up by maybe being defensive that kind of a thing christine you said earlier i want to make sure i understand you talked about spiritual response therapy what is your definition of that spiritual response therapy is the name of a particular kind of work that has been developed through the 70s the originator robert dexler with two other people people. And what they did was using their intuitive side, using a pendulum and asking questions, they develop charts and questions that help us, again, bypass the ego, get into that subconscious and identify and clear. And so it is work that is done in the spiritual realms that the purpose is to not just identify, it's to then to clear it. And again, we're complicated people. We might clear layers of, say, unworthiness, right? But then something else might come around and then you realize it's, oh, that's related to having to share all my life. Oh, I didn't, that was under the other one. So things bubble up. 
up and we want to identify and clear them so that we're not operating from that. Because when we're operating from our little child who is not feeling comfort or safe. It's like dealing with a child that's having a tamper tantrum. Yeah. It's unreasonable. You're not reaching them. They're not listening. They're so angry at the world. And so people, it's not that obvious, but it just, again, it shows up. And it, one of the other purposes and reasons to really do our inner child work is it where it shows up the most is in relationships, both intimate personal relationships, but also friendships, family. So I look at it and trust me, if my family, if they watch this podcast they're gonna laugh because we know even every time we get together it's up sometimes it's there's that same thing or sometimes it's oh we got rid of that but now look what's showing up and so it is a little bit you know we come together clash and then everybody goes to their own corner to figure it out to <laughs> do their healing and over the years we've come together better and better because you most of us are doing our work i think for people who are listening that was when i went to sedona christine was the very first person that i was fortunate enough to meet there she was my first practitioner and we did spiritual response therapy i had never heard of it before and how incredibly unbelievably insightful it was in bubbling up those things it was such a wonderful way to start that experience the whole week-long experience because it surfaces things that you just don't realize are there and to your point offers you ways to start clearing them through that experience right away it doesn't mean that it's be all end all forever and ever because other things can come back and trigger you as well but it's just in that recognition that those points are there and what else was fascinating was it wasn't just from the triggers from this lifetime. You right. were able to identify things from past lifetimes that I brought in with me that I recognized right away, even though they were from past lives. You could just, when you bubbled them up, I was like, oh yeah. I feel that it yeah. was so real. So yeah. it's just a wonderful, yeah. we've learned about so many tools through all of our conversations with people who've come talk to us on our podcast. This is just another one that feels like a method almost to being able it, to- It is. It's a well-established method. It, there's an association, the Spiritual Response Association, if you'd like to look it up. We have to do ongoing education to keep ourselves clear. I use other people that do this work and I like other work too. Listen, again, I love what you guys are doing because- it's it's not a, one approach isn't a, the blanket. I like to look at it as we're shining the diamond and the diamond has lots of facets and one tool is not going to be appropriate for every facet. So this is one of my best go-tos and it does shift people. It has a nice immediate response and it alleviates some of the weight of emotions, but one tool is not going to do it, which well, is I'm why what you guys do is so awesome. You're exposing a lot of options and tools for people. Thank you. And I want people to know I've worked with you remotely with doing spiritual response therapy too. It doesn't have to be only in person. You're able to do it virtually as well. Absolutely. Especially because it's taking place in the spiritual realms. There is no time or space in there. We don't have to be in the same room. So that's what makes it so easy to do it distance. You are quite an expert at it. Watching you do the work is it's really cool, I have to say. I love it. Thank you very much. This was great. Thank you for being so open and vulnerable and also offering your wisdom and guidance and really practical exercises that we can all do every single day throughout your day, I should say. That's right. Thank you because I absolutely needed to hear this today. I needed those reminders of uh, that little Robin inside me and to really comfort her throughout yes. the day. We're always pushing yeah. ourselves to be better, do better, improve. And we really forget that at our essence are worthy. We are love. We are enough just the way we are. We don't have to do all those extra things to improve ourselves. So it really is a great way to just reflect back on, on the essence of, of who we are. A hundred percent. I'm really going to share this beautiful. with my daughter who's about to turn 15. I feel like even she's old enough and yet young enough to very much remember little Bella. And, yes. and utilize this tool because I know she wouldn't want to be saying that to her little self either. And I, I know that she goes through a lot of these feelings. And to your point, from a parenting, I'm certainly not any sort of perfect parent, but I very much have made a very conscious choice in how I talk to Bella, but it's how she talks to herself. So a hundred percent with 
my one daughter, I always complimented her about her body and because I grew up differently and was really affirming and all of that. But she had body dysmorphia. She went into bulimia, anorexia. It was so baffling to me. But guess what? It's because she was witnessing me beating myself up. Wow. What I was modeling was wow. more impactive than what I was saying. What a good reminder. What a yeah. good reminder, parents. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. glad we got yeah. that in. Wow. That's, big. That's really big. Christine, yeah. we'll be talking to you more. Love We're it. so grateful for you and really thank you. Love and it. for anyone that wants to work with Christine or find out more about her, you can visit thesedonalifecoach.com. We'll have the link in our show notes as well. That's awesome. Thank I love you, you ladies so much. Love Appreciate you. so much you. what you do. And we'll be talking soon. We will. Bye.